Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. This week, we're going to talk about a topic that's really the underpinning of all of our conversations, all of our topics here, and that is intimacy. And when we think of the word intimacy, most of us immediately think sex. And while sex is a form of intimacy, we want to spend some time today really breaking down the depths of what intimacy actually is. In getting ready for this episode, I actually was inspired to look up what the official definition of intimacy is. And of course, there's many different sources that give their own version of a definition. But the two main concepts that I found coming up when I Googled intimacy were familiarity and closeness. And in my opinion, and I believe probably your own as well, that's what intimacy really is built from. The knowing of oneself, and then of course the sharing of oneself, like we often talk about, sharing my ideas, sharing my feelings, even sharing my self-expression. How am I in the world? That allows then that not just closeness, but that authentic closeness where I am me and I'm expressing myself to someone else in the world. So for instance, say you, Jenna, and then the intimacy that or the bonding that comes from that can be considered an intimate relationship, really. What we're describing is so much more than just taking off one's clothes and instead taking off one's figurative clothes, taking off our patterns, our masks, our safety mechanisms, everything that we hide behind and actually letting that authentic self, our full self-expression emerge. And for many of us, we we spend time in this pursuit of meeting that person or honing into who that self-expressed authentic self is. And instead of searching externally, I'd remind us all, and I remind myself daily to turn and sit in stillness, to sit in reflection, in quiet with myself first and connecting with self as again, like you hear every week when we're talking about intimacy, well, before intimacy with another comes, intimacy with self comes. And it's taking that time to truly sit, to see all of your wounds, to see all of even the darkness and the light or what triggers you, what is vulnerable, what is scary. Knowing that and discovering that for yourself first and being able to sit in that. When I'm able to be intimate with myself, to create safety in myself and see where I'm scared or where little Jenna is reactive. And in that moment, remind myself that I am safe, create a safe environment. I'm creating such a strong, intimate bond and connection with myself first. And when I'm able to do that, I'm unconsciously and consciously then paving the way for me to extend and radiate that outward into my connections with others. I'm reminded of a conversation you and I had just last week on our live virtual check-in the self-healer circle where I think one of us used the term speak your truth and then a member asked for clarification, asking us essentially, what does that mean when I hear you or other people saying this word or, or describing this action of speaking one's truth? And like you're very beautifully describing it, Jenna, our self-expression is our truth, whether that's our thoughts, our ideas, like I was sharing earlier, our feelings, or just our journey in the world. And to speak to your point, so many of us don't do that. We're conditioned out of doing that. Again, based in early experiences where maybe we felt shamed, maybe we didn't have space or safety to allow our truth to be present in the world. So we did what you perfectly described. We begin to wear masks. We begin to, like I know I did, filter our truth through whatever lens it is. My number one applied lens was always, how will my truth make others feel? And if I ever came to the awareness or the belief real or imagined, of course, that whatever it is I was feeling like I wanted to share, the feeling I was having in the moment, a thought I was having, if I had any indication that that could be problematic or upsetting to another person, I stopped. I didn't share those things that I think could upset another person. And for my own journey, it really was around this concept of first seeing all of the different ways that I wasn't allowing myself to be familiar or to be known or to be intimate with another person. And that all began in my own mind with me applying that filter, me running a narrative of, oh, this is going to upset someone else. So before I knew it, the only thing I presented to the world was what I thought was the most least upsetting version of myself. And what I did then as a byproduct was I kept myself not intimate. I, I didn't know myself enough and what my truth was to even be able to then share that with the world, which is why we're having this conversation here today. 
really expanding that definition of what intimate is so that we can begin to gain that familiarity, which first begins for most of us in seeing all of these different filters, all of these different masks, all of the roles that we play that aren't maybe authentic to who we are inside. I think as a collective, as a society or world, most of us walk around unaware of our disconnection to true intimacy and do associate, well, intimacy is this physical act. So that's just over there and that's fine. When intimacy is a moment to moment thing, it is speaking that truth and first even identifying what that truth is. And I have a lot of compassion here for myself, for you, for everyone who looks at this for themselves, because so often we're unaware that how we're showing up in the world isn't a true representation of our fully authentic, fully self-expressed selves. And a lot of the time we do do that for safety. We do that for acceptance. We do that for the love that we desire with a core belief and often hidden core belief deep within that we're not worthy or deserving of what true intimacy is, that rawness, that connection of your soul truly seeing my soul. There's a visual here I thought of when you were sharing, Nicole, uh, that we've talked about before that's putting on these sunglasses. So that experience that Nicole shared, whatever it was that happened in that moment, whether as a child, adulthood, something occurs, you tell yourself, okay, it's unsafe to speak my truth, or maybe your opinion wasn't received. So you tell yourself to shut down. You start to withhold your truth. If you think of a small child, they run around, they sing, they speak their mind. They do that with any sort of filter. It's an abandon. They just express. As we grow, as we're in different situations, environments, groups of people, we want to fit in. Our survival wants to stay with the collective. So we do start to betray ourselves. We start to stay quiet. We start to not sing and share our voice out of fear of judgment or shame. So each of those experiences, you can imagine when I do that, when I betray myself or I honor my full expression and I stop singing, I stop speaking my truth, I'm putting on a pair of sunglasses. In the next experience that I have that maybe I put myself out there or I express love and it isn't received how I want it, I put on another pair of sunglasses. I prove myself, oh, it's not safe to do that. Now, 35 years down the road, I have dozens and dozens of these pairs of sunglasses in front of my face. So when I'm looking out into the world, I'm not seeing true, authentic reality. I'm not seeing from my full, just heart center and my expressed self. I'm seeing through the lens of all of these filters, all of these experiences. Each one of those pairs of sunglasses is an experience that created a filter where I then made a story about it and betrayed myself. When we're talking about true intimacy here, it's taking off those sunglasses one by one, removing all of the filters until what you have standing in front of yourself first is simply you, your heart center, your soul, your being, not the conditioned self that society has created. When I'm able to spend time with myself first and removing those layers, that's intimacy with self. That's my opportunity to then welcome myself, to see my own truth and be safe with myself. When I can do that, I can then go look to Nicole. And though it feels scary, maybe gut-wrenching, maybe it makes me tremble or want to cry, which it does in real time and space. Now, even at 35, there are moments, Nicole, when I look into your eyes and it feels trembling, it feels scary because I know that I'm coming to you with no filters and I'm doing that being safe and also being received in your environment of safety, which is almost the most horrifying part of intimacy itself. It's not even putting yourself out there to be raw and truthful and intimate. For me, the real work is actually allowing myself to receive the fact that you're receiving me in love. You're seeing all of my wounding in layers and still receiving me in an environment of love and safety. These layers you're describing and this disconnection really for, for many of us lives in the reality that we spend all of our time, most if not all of our time, in our thinking mind, meaning paying attention to our thoughts, just running an endless narrative through our mind and allowing that to have all of its power. This knowing, this truth, this deeper space that we're trying to express to the world actually isn't going to 
come in words and thoughts through our mind at all. It's going to come like you were very beautifully describing when we take moments for some of us, new moments to begin to reconnect with our body, with our deeper feelings, with that intuitive space that mo most of us are, are looking for. That's where this truth comes from. It's not the repetitive stories we tell ourselves. It's not the same feeling that we tend to recycle and always need to express to someone else. It's the other stuff. It's the stuff that when we do peel back our layers of conditioning and take a moment to spend time with ourselves, it's that deeper space, those deeper feelings. That's what comes from that authentic space. And that's what we're talking about sharing with someone else. I was sharing yesterday on another podcast about this window of really coming back to love and this centered, grounded space, even in a moment of reactivity or being triggered. And I was talking about our relationship. So myself, Nicole and Lolly, and really acknowledging how short that window of time after what I call kerfuffles or when we get into, you know, little snarky disagreements and the window of time to coming back to this connectedness and this love gets down so small to literally it can be seconds where I watch my, you know, stubborn, prideful, indignant self sometimes want to hold on to my frustration with the other person. Or Lolly said something the other day I wanted to be really annoyed at her for and realized I actually don't want to be annoyed. That's just pushing further away, going into my turtle shell and my comfort zone of not being intimate. When in reality, what was said, I don't even remember what was said because it was so insignificant. It wasn't a big deal. And I was so quickly able to realize, oh my gosh, I'm madly in love with this person and with these people. I don't want to be in that space. And if I'm in that space, it's just that thought. It's exactly what you're describing, Nicole. It's that thinking mind on autopilot, just in that cycle that's going to keep going. And I didn't want to be in it. I knew that that was happening. And I thought, oh, wow, I'm actually just one thought away from an entirely different experience. Do I want to choose it or not? I could have chose to go down that cycle. However, for me, I couldn't have stood in that in that moment because I knew I was doing it. I knew I was tormenting myself when really all I wanted was that intimacy. I wanted to reach out and grab her and just hug her and be in love and actually be love itself. You don't have to search for love when it's where you come from. And I repeat that to myself so often. And for me, that itself is also such an underpinning of intimacy is that it's recreated moment to moment to moment. I choose Nicole and Lolly every moment over and over and over. So this intimacy and that closeness and connection, speaking your truth, like all things that we talk about on our journeys and in our lives is not one and done. I'm not going to go to the gym once, lift up one weight and, you know, have these muscles for the rest of my life. It's consistent. And for many of us, the journey doesn't begin in those moments of conflict where we have that insight where you're able to literally see, Jenna, your conditioning very much at play, pulling you to hold on to that frustration. And also in that same space, reconnect with your authentic truth. For many of us, the journey begins not in those heated moments. We can't even access maybe that deeper truth in those moments, or we are so unfamiliar with any gesture of intimacy, any sharing of what is actually happening for me, that those moments are going to feel too overwhelming and too scary. So for a lot of us, the practice begins in sharing things that feel a bit safer, that aren't us being so emotionally vulnerable in any one given moment. It might begin with us sharing thoughts, interest over something that happened very externally throughout our day. And for a lot of us, that's the practice that then builds us to being able to have those intimate moments when we're having a reaction, when we are wanting to actually shift in to that deeper space of knowing and not live in our conditioning, we can't do that right away. We need to practice becoming familiar with ourselves enough and safe enough to share so that when we get to those moments of reactivity, we can begin to expand like you're very beautiful describing and hold space for both. And that moment that I used to describe just there that Nicole's speaking of, that's a byproduct of continuous recreation and continuous choosing to be doing that work, to in the moment be witnessing myself. That in itself is a form of intimacy for me to 
spend time watching my thoughts, watching where my mind does go. And then to be able to separate, see that, choose something different, that's a massive step. Though that step came, that was the effect of a cause. The cause there was my choice to be aware of it, to begin practicing it. So wherever that falls down the road for you, we're all going to be at different places. Some of you in the very beginning, you might be able to catch your thoughts right away. Others, it might feel like it's years and years. And I want to remind everyone here too, that we, Nicole and I ourselves, since we're the ones here, we've been doing this work. When I say the work, you know, looking internally, shining the light on ourselves, looking at all of the bits and pieces and parts of us that maybe we don't want to acknowledge, that maybe we aren't that proud of. We've been doing that almost obsessively for years and years now. So it does unfold with this consistent practice and time. And you're still human along the way. There are still moments even now where Maybe it's not even until later I'll send, well, I don't love texting, but sometimes I do. I will send a text to you or in the past I've sent a text to share with you something that I wanted to speak an hour or two ago, but I couldn't because it was just too vulnerable. Or even if I'm communicating with my family or my brother and yesterday he sent some family photos, even sharing those family photos with you and Lolly, for me, I watch a wall go up. I watch myself still want to preserve myself and create or keep space between ourselves and push that connection away because disconnection is comfort. That connection and that intimacy to say, here's what's going on in my family. Here's my family. Here's this picture of little Jenna at this time that was really dark for me. Those can be very scary and very intimate things. So however long you've been doing this work, wherever you are on the journey, there's not one There's not one linear path. There's not one footstep that I'm going to step into that everyone else will. And there's not another footstep I'm going to step into that everyone else has been in. It's going to look different for everyone. So all of those moments of reactivity and responsiveness are going to come sprinkled. I can catch myself in reactivity with Lolly the same day that my my soul feels too timid to share with you a photo because that feels too intimate. I appreciate you actually sharing that with on this podcast and with me right now, because I'm over here feeling surprised (laughs) because again, and this is a conversation you and I had a couple of weeks ago, um, in terms of closeness and connection and definition and what it means to different people. And that same conversation applies here. So for me, showing pictures doesn't feel as intimately close of a moment. So when you were to show me the picture, as we all do, I insert, you know, my lens over it, which is, oh, I'm being showed a picture. Okay. I can register the picture and keep it moving. However, I would have had no way of knowing that for you behind the scenes, there was vulnerability there. I mean, geez, I'm hearing you had to even talk yourself into, to some extent, showing me this piece of, of your history. And I wouldn't have known that because outwardly, there was, wasn't really an indication that anything was happening except showing of a picture. So again, this conversation applies when we talk about intimacy, which is knowing that what feels intimate or close and, or the other side of that unfamiliar and unsafe, because it's something new for me might be different than what you're seeing the other person experience or what might be going on behind the scenes. And so to speak to your point, it is a very individualized journey before I could really make impact in paying attention to all of the stories that my mind was telling me, I had to spend probably the better part of my first year when I began my journey, just focusing on reconnecting with my body. How can I be conscious? Because I had spent so much time disconnected from my body, so much time lost in thought that spending more time up there wasn't actually the journey I was on. The journey I was on, like we were just talking about, was reconnecting with that deeper intuitive space so that I could then see all of these different filters I was applying. So I didn't even start that phase of the journey until I learned how to be consciously present with my body, with where my intuition lives. And for me, that took a daily commitment day in and day out. It's still top of my future self journal every day, a reminder now years in That my journey begins and ends with how present am I to myself, to my inner space of knowing. And when I'm not, 
then I'm likely to be recycling those old habits, those old patterns and speaking things that aren't actually my truth. So all of this conversation for me is built on that foundation of how can I stay intimately first connected with my body, with my knowing. Which as we're hearing is done by being present. If you're not choosing to be present. If we aren't consciously present, there's nothing wrong with that though. We know that it's an absolute guarantee that then everything that is happening, your whole experience is a recycling of the past. You're putting your past experiences right into your future by having them show up in the present. If you're not choosing different, if you're not being present and not being conscious. And to be clear, those photos, Nicole, the thing that stopped me from sharing them also was these are photos that Josh, my twin brother, got developed, like 40 rolls of film that my mom has had under her bed for the last 20, 25 years. So a lot of these photos are photos of Jake and they're photos that I've never seen. They're photos of time periods, you know, when I was disconnected with Jake or came back into connection. So for me too, part of what was there when I decided not to share them or I was felt very vulnerable and emotional about sharing them was processing that grief and realizing too, just as you're speaking that, oh my gosh, grief is one of the most intimate things that one person can experience because it is a power that truly almost takes over you. It is a depth of new physical feeling and new physical pain that for me, the depth of losing a brother, you know, I've lost loved ones. Absolutely though. Losing Jake has showed me new corners of my soul and my own heart that I'm experiencing for the first time. And I have a lot of compassion for myself, even realizing this in this moment, that why I chose then not to share was me being aware in that moment that I didn't, I honestly didn't feel like breaking down into tears. I didn't want to cry. I don't even feel like crying now, though I'm being mindful of the fact that those emotions do come up. And this circles back full circle to what we're saying, but how it lives inside your body. I've said before, um, Nietzsche has a quote that is my absolute favorite. And it says, there is more wisdom in your body than in your greatest philosophy. And if we really do pause to acknowledge that, yeah, we have this thinking mind that's running all these thoughts nonstop up here. And we just let that be. And we put our hand over our heart or on our belly and we feel our lungs inflating and deflating. And we actually physically feel ourself in this present moment and come back to our bodies. I'm able to then witness and see what's happening. Oh, there's these new, really raw feelings of grief that are so physical it's immobilizing sometimes, or it comes out of left field. Now, when I'm aware that that's happening, grief for me is absolutely a physical feeling. New depths of those feelings are so raw to me that if Nicole were to see them, that's more intimate to me than any physical act because she's seeing a part of me that I have yet to see. And this is why we highlight continuously that Intimacy, if we're talking about intimacy outward with any other person in any form, emotionally, physically, spiritually, that intimacy comes from self-intimacy first, from me being naked with myself in this dark corner of this despair and grief and allowing myself to be safe, telling myself I'm safe, being in my body, feeling the physical pain and understanding and acknowledging how powerful I am and just how okay I am. When I do that, that's the deepest connection that I have to my knowing and my soul. And I can choose to be present with Nicole. I can choose to be conscious and allow her to see that. That to me is a deeper intimacy than than any physical act that we could really be discussing. And speaking of choice, I want to highlight here as well to speak to your point earlier too, which is we can also choose that we're not yet ready to share our truth with another person. Just because we're starting to form it and reconnect with ourselves doesn't mean that immediately in that moment, even those of us that have that safe relationship or that safe community doesn't mean that immediately we have to share it out with it, tell the world about it. <laughs> it's like, and we didn't, this was last week or a couple days ago. And now you're hearing about this for the first time yes. 
yes. while our listeners are. And I, I think that's an important thing to highlight because I know a lot of us have, we have this idea that the second we have a thought, <laughs> we're being withholding or, or we're being private and keeping secrets because we're not sharing maybe this new truth, this new realization with the world around us. And it really is our choice with where and when and to, and to whom these things get spoken. So using that choice wisely and reminding yourself that just because you're coming into a knowing that you need to also then feel safe once you then speak your truth to someone else, withholding space for whatever their reaction might be. So going back to me, little Nicole, always worried about worrying or upsetting the world around her, little by little, as I began to empower myself to speak my truth, that meant then holding space for how that truth would be received. And not everyone is going to agree. Even your loved one might not see, or there might be something in what you're, they're hearing you say that activates a deeper wound for them. So in that moment, can you allow misunderstanding? Can you allow your partner, your friend, whoever it is to have their own then emotional reaction with what they've heard you say? And if you are too vulnerable, if it doesn't feel safe enough, if you don't yet know how to return to safety, if they do have some reaction that might then destabilize you, then's not the time to share that truth. So again, Choice absolutely applies here, taking the time to know yourself, going on that journey, and then creating the resources that over time you can begin to still be stabilized, to still feel safe, even if you are having a reaction around you. And there's that word that is sprinkled all throughout every single one of our episodes, and that is choice. It is our choice also what level of intimacy we want to have, how we want intimacy to show up in our lives, how intimate I want to be, that's my choice. It's also my responsibility. If I want an intimate relationship with my partner, if I want that emotional intimacy, that spiritual intimacy, then that's my job. That's not Nicole's job over there. It's my job to sit with myself, to feel my body, to actually drop in and witness having a body, having a heartbeat, being this incredibly worthy, beautiful Jenna and being intimate with all of the layers of me. When I do that, I then have a choice to express, okay, how do I want to connect with others? What others do I want to connect with? Who do I want to connect with? And again, we are responsible for us. I'm not responsible for Nicole and how she chooses to show up for herself over there. However, I do have the choice to choose who I want to surround myself with. Once I've done the work for myself, I can then create any environment that I want. If I want intimacy, I'm going to spend that time with me. I want to live a life and choose to live a life filled with love and intimacy with my partners around me. So I'm doing the work with me and have then sought out partners who are doing the same thing. It's aligned. And if they weren't doing the same thing, there's nothing wrong with that. Though, again, that's an opportunity and a responsibility for me to then have a conversation with myself and see, okay, so this is how I'm showing up for me. Is this person or this connection over here aligned? Do I want to be connecting my most intimate self with that person? Is that what they're also wanting to receive and give back? The answer that they have is for them. Neither is right. Neither is wrong. It's purely information and it's neutral information. When you gain that information from another about how they want their experience to be, I then, again, have choice. I get to choose if that's someone I spend my time connecting and being intimate with, or if I take that information and realize that I deserve and am choosing to have a match, to find a partner or partnership or community that is a match and in alignment with the level of intimacy that I'm creating for myself. But before I can choose that, I have to actually take the actions, sit with myself, be intimate with myself first and actually do the work. Essentially, to simplify it, being present, becoming <laughs> familiar, knowing yourself. And that begins with that awareness, with literally that presence. I'm going to say that word again because it's so important. You can't be fully present with another person unless you're fully present with yourself. And for me, sometimes those are the most intimate moments when you and I are sitting outside, not even maybe saying anything, just in the sunshine together, in that state 
of pure presence. When your attention is there with me, that for me allows me to feel that degree an intimacy and nothing's actually happening in any given moment. We're not actually exchanging words. I'm not telling you some deeper truth. For me, the most intimate moments exist in that presence because again, I'm someone who was always distracted, who was always in my mind, who was always on my spaceship, who were somewhere else entirely. So being able to establish presence and to be able to be just me in a given moment sometimes looks like silence, like looks like two humans experiencing whatever's happening around them together. And for me, that can be one of my most intimate moments and also one of the most unfamiliar and scary ones. I want to thank you for sharing that. I want to zoom out for a minute because while there's things to gain from Nicole sharing that experience, if we zoom out, it's also so cool that I didn't know that about you. So, I mean, I know that you love that presence. There's an intimacy in that connection, though I've never heard you say it like that. I've never heard you articulate it that way, which makes me realize that even despite the value of things that we're sharing here, if I zoom out and just witness the fact that a conversation itself is happening, whether being recorded for a podcast or not, this communication is a form of intimacy. Us being here and recording this episode, even with Furk on behind the scenes here listening, that's another layer of intimacy. And we're doing it then to share it with all of you. So Communication here, I realize, is also such an underpinning of that intimacy. It is first and foremost always communication with yourself. You could put self really in front of any of the tools that we teach. Here it's self-intimacy first. And then that extended intimacy with another. I want to learn Nicole. Nicole might have a completely different definition of intimacy than me. Now, obviously, she doesn't because we're here discussing what intimacy means to us, though it's worth hearing your partners, hearing the environment around you. Each of us is surrounded by people who have just as dynamic and complex lives and personalities as each of us. They have a world of thoughts and opinions of their own. So if I think that my voice is worthy of hearing and that my words hold value, I also am looking at the other person as a massive being who has so much value, who also deserves to be heard and holding space for that, even if it does differ. So even just here having this conversation with you, the things that I've shared with you, the things that you've shared with me, that only came from us consciously choosing to sit down to be present with one another. Yes, we're working, we're talking about presence, we're talking about intimacy for a podcast, though this is actually what the work looks like as well. We're choosing to be present. We're choosing to take off all of those sunglasses right now. We're staring into each other's eyes, which used to make me feel sick to my stomach. And now over time, because I've consistently practiced that's just normal now. That's comfortable now for me with you because our intimacy and our connection, I see a sparkle in your eye right now too, <laughs> because our intimacy and connection has gotten so much stronger because we've chosen to be willing to communicate with each other. And we can only communicate with each other because we both sit with ourselves. I depend on sitting in stillness and quiet with myself. Sometimes for hours a day, I might just need to go and do my own thing. And I know that's where I'm at. I know that's what I need. When I go fulfill that for myself, I'm able to show up here with you and discuss so many more depths of even our relationship and do it for a recording for thousands of people. That's like a bonus of intimacy that we get. And all we're choosing to do is say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to be present in front of you right now. And five seconds from now, I'm going to create being present again and again and again and again. So it really is every second I'm choosing to be intimate. I'm choosing to let those layers down or I'm choosing to accept that, you know, maybe I'm not ready to share that with you, though. I know if I'm not ready to express something or share or connect with another, then that's something for me to look at. And maybe I should go pencil in and schedule in some time for me to spend time with myself. I was smiling um, when I you caught the twinkle in my eye. And I think we couldn't <laughs> have planned this better because this was a really kind of prime example of that deeper intimacy, that intimacy that really just sparked through a change. And I don't know what you even saw in my eye, something shifted, right? <laughs> and you felt 
that, right? This is what we're talking about here. This was not a thought I shared that clicked into some knowing of your own. This was something that was nonverbal. It was communicated, like you very beautifully said, in the twinkle of an eye. And for a lot of us, that's the deeper connection that we're talking about, coming from our bodies, coming from that deeper intuitive space. I didn't choose to make my eyes do or shift or change in any way, yet my deeper self did because there was a, a registering, a resonance in that moment. And you saw it. And a lot of times we're speaking, or not a lot of times, all of the time, our human being is speaking. Our nervous system is speaking. We're sending out all of these nonverbal signals to the, to the world around us. And when we're purely present as you and I are having this conversation right now, now we have access to that deeper state of knowing, those nonverbal cues, that just a resonance that we feel when our skin gets tingly in the good way. And I know for me that happens. Anytime I hear someone say something that I resonate with, I get chills around my body. It's like my being is saying, yes, Nicole, this applies to you. You like this. Like, yes, thumbs up. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about this deeper space, this inner knowing, this authentic self. And sometimes, like we just lived here in the moment, it happens when words aren't even involved, when it is just two beings, two hearts connecting with each other without even anything being said. And I think those chills that Nicole's describing or that feeling of me feeling that connection from her through being present and looking at her without her even saying it, that's energy. It was an energy transfer. And we were sitting outside the other day and on these, we have like these poof giant pillow things outside. And when they sit in the sun, they're very hot. And I laid down on one, it like scorches you for a couple <laughs> seconds and then it goes away. And I love it because it is almost unbearable only for a few seconds. And then we adapt to it. And really Nicole sat down again, she got super hot and I I'm just a nerd about certain things. I was like, yeah, it's a heat transfer. How cool is that? The pillow is so hot. When we lay on it, it does scorch you and that heat transfers to us. I then have absorbed it and I've now adapted to it. It's the same when we're talking about being, when Nicole's saying, you know, as we're speaking all of our time, regardless of what we're saying or not saying, we are always being. We are always emanating energy from our being. I said in one of the last podcast episodes, we create and choose the weather around us. I think all of us have experienced either walking into a room or being the one to walk in a room where there is an energy there. You can tell there's unspoken things. There's an elephant in the room. You feel that. And this beautiful connection that I just felt from seeing this twinkle in Nicole's eyes was to me an alignment of what I'm feeling and what I'm saying and an alignment of Nicole being able to receive it. So quite literally, we were in the same energy space or on that same frequency. There was so much alignment in my word because my word was actually speaking my truth. I was and am being so present that the words that are coming out are very grounded and they're coming almost like music, quite literally straight from my heart to you. And when that experience happens and there is so much harmony and alignment, it is physically felt. Our heart feels it. Our souls feel it. We do get those chills or our hairs all stand up. It's a physical response to physical energy that is being emanated by our being. So to bring this conversation now full circle, right? this word intimacy that so many of us really reduce down to acts of physical pleasure, being sexual with another person really is so much more than that. It is a state of knowing, a familiarity, right? Like we shared earlier, a closeness that comes from presence, that comes from knowing all of the self, peeling back those layers, having these conversations, taking the time to be present with who you are at your core, dropping into your body, understanding that it is sending you messages. It will tell you when things feel good and it will just as equally tell you when things don't feel as good. Your body holds this wisdom. This is why we have these conversations, is to give you the language for some of you, the tools for others, how to begin to understand yourself in a new way. It is only when we can understand ourselves that we can then truly be intimate with another human being. So in service of intimacy and connections and authenticity, we look forward to continuing this conversation with you all on our next episode.